water pumps and how and how the uh, water pumps sometimes were so far apart that some people would drive to the water pumps. Um, that was interesting because the water pump was actually at the corner of my um, street where my grandparents lived. Um, up above that car is a group that is Mrs. Catherine Banks and her daughters. And, I, and they, they're standing right there on the side of St. John Baptist Church, one of the first church in the city. I mean, in that in the city, in the community. It was not the first organized one because Reverend Jackson at that time um, in 1930, he, was, he had a Sunday school class and he would have his Sunday school class up on a hill and um, he would give the kids candy. He would go door to door asking the neighbors to please let their children come to Sunday school. The other, in the middle, a little boy with the um, lady, the lady is my grandmother, Mrs. Gladys Smith Tate, Tate Smith, and the little boy is my brother, um, Frank Tate. The other photos is of um, Donald Hughes, who was an ANC, an active ANC, and a very active, good activist in this community, and still is. And I love uh, Mr. Hughes. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, interviewing him next time around. Um, yes. I did not know that was Donald. Oh my yes. God. <laughs> yes, that's Donald. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. We have one more slide. And uh, Mrs. Thomas, um, can you talk to us a little bit about this slide and these pictures? <sighs> okay. Um, there's not a lot of clarity. So, you know, I'll try to explain the first one on the left. And um, that's Central Avenue and 53rd Street, but it's the one at B Street and Bass Place. The houses that you see were houses that were built uh, for the returning Black veterans from World War II. And that's where I am today. <laughs> I was born there and I'm still there. And we have pictures of some of the older frame houses that people built. And one of Metrotone Baptist Church, I think in one sideline, as we talk about how the church is so vitally important in Marshall Heights. I rode my 95 year old dad around one day. I said, let's count all the churches. And I think we stopped at like 17. It's for such a small community that shows you that the church and religion is a very integral part of our community. And um, we have pictures of uh, some of the other houses where the children are playing and uh, someone drawing water from one of the pumps. I think this might be the same picture that we saw earlier. And also I thought about when she talked about, when uh, Ms. Tate talked about the streams, that um, there was a, a fresh water stream down by, I think where Benco is. Mm -hmm. And prior to the pumps, everyone took their buckets yeah. and went down yes. and brought the water up there. You know, that's a, that's a grueling life. Okay? I was about to say, with all these hills, the walk yes. back? All these yes. hills, <laughs> when yes. you're down the hill and you went dip that water from the spring, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Okay. And uh, Ms. Thomas, um, in particular, yeah. I know this isn't within the time frame that we're discussing, but where did these pictures come from? It looks like it's from some type of book. Oh, okay. Oh, gosh. Maybe 24, might, we might be coming up on 25 years ago. Um, several of my friends who were still probably integral in the community both lost their brothers. And everyone kept saying at these funerals, um, why is it that we only get together when someone dies? So a little group of us got together and said, well, why don't we try to have a picnic? And we mm -hmm. started out and maybe you had maybe 20, 25 people there. And the last one, I think just before the pandemic was over a hundred people. The oldest person there was 99 and there was like a three or four week old baby. So people tell people, they tell their relatives. And so the, the core group of us, you know, it's like, well, there are new people coming in all the time. I have to pull Miss Tate in on this now, <laughs> you know, so she can be a part of this next time we have one. Yeah, and so it's the Central Avenue reunion and we've been doing it every year for the last 24, I think it's 24 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Um, Jasper, we are eager to uh, to get to start talking to you and uh, looking forward to your questions. Ooh. 
Great, and thank you all for that excellent presentation. It's so great to you know be able to get some context and you know see some uh, you know of the historic images from the neighborhood as well that kind of go along with <clears throat> the uh, oral history interviews. And I did want to also kind of you know um, just like pause at this time to kind of set up that aspect of things. Um, this is the um, oral history coffee chat, of course, um, part of the DC Oral History Collaborative. Um, and um, in 2020, uh, Keith applied for and was awarded a grant from the DC Oral History Collaborative to record oral histories, you know, as part of this um, project. Um, and, um, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that we like to do with the oral history coffee chat is talk, you know, about the topics, the themes, you know, um, the kind of memories, the narratives that came out of those oral history projects. But the other thing that we like to do is kind of talk about the process and what went into doing the oral history um, project. So, you know, you'll hear some questions um, that are about both things, you know, about what was learned as part of the project and what went into making it. Uh, because one of the things that we want to do is, you know, people who are listening to this, people who might be participating with us today, um, you know, we want to kind of provide them some information that might help them as they think about doing oral histories with their communities as well. So just a little bit of, you know, basic information about what we're trying to do here with the coffee chat. But, you know, we also want to, you know, really focus on, you know, kind of what, um, you know, stories came out of this project with Marshall Heights. And I should ask Keith, um, you know, um, I know that you also have some clips um, that um, you and Ms. Thomas and Ms. Tate are all, you know, interested in sharing from the project as well. Um, are there any of those that you'd like to kind of share to start things off? Or are you going to kind of let us know as we kind of go through the conversation when might be um, the right time to share those clips? Um, I guess we can start with a teaser and then we can kind of go through as we talk about things and bring up some other clips. That sounds great. Okay. Which one would you want to start with? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> Let's see. The first clip that I selected on that on the chart is. Uh, sorry for the delay. To remind myself. I think it was um, um, Ms. Thomas's clip about um, the creation of Southern Avenue. That was the first one that was on the chart. Oh yes, could we could we start with that, please? What about when they created Southern Avenue? Did they have to knock down? Hated it. Really? So what, what, what you, what oh, oh gosh, didn't you? That, that well, I live right you here at, at, so at Southern Avenue and C. Right. The lady that lived on the Capitol High side, Miss Tim, she just died. Son. And um, they used to park all their cars up there. Yes. Yeah. And <laughs> remember that. Like, I think we were fine with it at first, but then I'm like, it's all this traffic. Oh, you because know. the traffic that will come from East Capitol now to try to, to get on the other yeah. side of the And also going toward that way. Going toward it's that heavy way. both ways. Okay. Okay, so we live almost four houses from the corner, four houses from Southern Avenue. And everything across the street from me was wood. Okay. The okay. boys had a clubhouse up in there. Okay. You know, they, they used to do that kind of thing. I think they, they had like a big tree house or something. I don't know. It was, I know we went up in there one day and they threatened to throw spiders on us or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> See, they, everybody thought they lived in suburbia or something. And we didn't, but we it, it had that kind of feel to it. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> Yeah, and we'll um, definitely just let us know, you know, kind of as we go through the conversation, Keith, Ms. Thomas, Ms. Tate, you know, if there's another clip that you feel like, you know, it's right to play kind of at the right time. But um, <clears throat> I wanted to, you know, just start things off by asking a really basic question. Um, can you talk about what drove the decision to start this oral history project? You know, what was kind of the motive behind it? Um, sure. So, 
you know, like I said, I, I'm originally from South Central Los Angeles, moved to Marshall Heights um, in 2015, I believe it was. Fell in love with the neighborhood immediately. Um, before I was, I was in the home buying process, visit a few different neighborhoods, but just something was about Marshall Heights that just made me want to settle my roots here and, and to raise a family. Um, as I started learning my neighbors, you know, some of them were getting up there in age and a lot of them were passing away. And I, it's so many great stories that they would tell me, you know, and the way that they were so welcoming to me, especially, you know, concerning like, you know, I'm an openly gay male too. And sometimes people aren't as friendly um, to, to people like that. But oh, my neighbors really embraced me. And uh, one neighbor in particular, she, she passed away maybe two years before I, I heard about this grant. And she would sit me down at her house and we would have the time of our lives talking about <laughs> things that went on in the neighborhood and the history of the neighborhood and how people in this community got together to get things done. And um, I just didn't want nobody, I didn't want us to lose that message as more people like myself are moving in. Um, I want, wanted to make sure that people understood that. Um, so I think I met Miss Tate probably a year later and talked to her about the Civic Association. And she was telling me about the project she was doing to retain this history in Marshall Heights. And uh, we, we started the Civic Association. And it just made sense to, to try to start recording these histories before we lost more people. Um, so that, that was really the driving force behind making sure we could record these histories. Great. And, um, you know, as you were kind of like thinking that through, you know, and you, um, you know, had your project plan in place, you know, and you started to kind of go out and assemble, you know, narrators, a project team, you know, thinking through who you wanted to be part of this project. Like, how did you go about bringing people together to be part of it? So we figured um, since the Marsh High Civic Association is an uh, entity and it's an organization that puts together events in the community that we could use all of our board members to serve as different roles on the project. So since I am the current chair, it makes sense for me to be project director and take all that abuse <laughs> with doing the extra work. Um, we thought it would be great for our treasurer to take on the role um, of the finance to monitor finance. And then we split up the other roles between our, um, our other um, elected body members. And, you know, we just all made a, a decision and, and dedicated ourselves to, to making sure that, that we accomplish everything we set out to do. Great. Um, so the next question is, um, you know, really for Ms. Tate and Ms. Thomas, um, you know, I'm looking, uh, I'm interested in kind of like finding out um, a little bit about, you know, the interview experience for this project. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And specifically, you know, were there any kind of hesitations on your part when you kind of first sat down to record your, you know, narratives, your memories, your stories? And if so, you know, like how, um, how were you able to kind of like move forward and feel more comfortable um, telling, telling, um, telling Keith, I guess, about those stories? I didn't hesitate at all when um, I received a flyer in my mailbox that said this uh, oral history group was being formed and, you know, come talk about Marshall Heights or something. And having been born and raised my family here and still here, you know, I said, let me go see what this is about. And I fell in love with Keith, <laughs> you know. And, mm -hmm. and so there was a, it was very easy to talk to him. And you know, because of my roots in the neighborhood, I, there was a lot of things that I, I don't mind talking about it. You know, I had good memories growing up here. I still have some good memories here, but um, it was something, with, it was very easy for me to talk, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, definitely, uh, you know, great when it kind of works out that way. I know, uh, you know, um, I myself am somebody who am a little bit more hesitant when things like that come up but yeah it's great you know like if you kind of have that long-standing history if you make a connection uh, you know immediately with the person who's leading the project and who's going to be doing the interviewing like that can really make things a lot smoother. Uh, Ms. Tate did you have a similar experience? Yes I, 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 I love the project I instantly when he told me about it I was writing the history of Marshall Light because uh, my grandparents both said one moved here in 1931. The other one moved here in 1934. And they, uh, they were part of the Civic Association. Um, I had a lot of history from 
neighbors and relatives and myself. And so I thought it was just fantastic that we would be able to record this. And then, and then Keith is such an engaging person. He really is. He gets you to do anything. Um, he has that smile that you just buy into it. Um, so he, he really came in a good time because the neighborhood is changing. And it would be nice to really go back and talk about one of the oldest black communities in this country. And, and, the, and, and the other thing is that um, I think because of a lot of things have happened and has been achieved here in the Marshall Lake neighborhood, I think it's about time that we tell the history of it. Because I think most of the time we talk about the Marshall Lake Community Development Organization and you wonder how does that, how does, how does that uh, connect to Marshall Lake Community? So those are the things that we need to bring light to. Great, yeah, and I think, um... You know, that kind of like, at least a little bit kind of segues into my next question that. Um, well, Jasper, you know, I was wondering, um, sure. mm -hmm. because they, they both talked about being like here in Marsh Heights, growing up in Marshall Heights. There is another clip that I think I took from uh, Debbie, uh, Mrs. Thomas and Mr. Thomas interview, where they're talking about playing as a kid in Marshall Heights. I'm wondering, maybe this might be a good time to play that one. Perfect time for it. Okay. digress a bit, you know, before Southern Avenue was cut through, how, how we could play in the street. Because, you you know, was C Street one way? <laughs> it used to, I remember when C Street used to be two way. I don't know how they did that, but it I'm was. Not, that's a narrow. It is a narrow it street, but it used narrow. to be two way. Okay. And, you know, so we would be out jumping double dutch and playing dodgeball yeah. and you know, mother may I, and you know, some of these are kickball and all of this, because we could just play in the street. It was like our playground. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Would any of you like to talk about that particular clip and just kind of like add additional context or talk a little bit more about what it was like kind of growing up and playing in the neighborhood? It was a time when everyone didn't have an automobile. So that was another reason why you could, we, my father did. And, you know, I mean, now every home has two or three cars, you know, then we, cause we share a driveway and, you know, might be one car here and maybe two or three neighbors down the street might have a car. And, and it was a cohesiveness. Everybody knew everyone else. And so you, you just played outside in the streets, you know, that's also a time when, you could play outside and, you know, you didn't come home until your mother called you, you know, it was not one of these, you know, don't you go anywhere where your parents are so fearful right now. There was no fear then, you know, we were outside, we were playing, the street lights came on, you went home, you know, so it was, it was just good times growing up. And I hadn't really thought about them uh, that much until I started doing this interview. And so a lot of those great memories came back to me. Great. I would like to answer answer the question of, of Debbie talking about um, C Street being one way. <laughs> C Street <laughs> was one way, well, two ways. It used to be two ways. But we <laughs> noticed when I was president of the Civic Association that it was hard getting through that street. So we were the ones who petitioned for it to be one way finally. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> See that power of Marshall Heights? Yes, yeah. indeed. <laughs> yeah. Great. So it sounds like, um, you know, certainly amongst your oral history interviews, um, you know, there was some commonality there in terms of talking about like how you used to kind of play and experience the space as children, um, you know, some of the games and everything. And I'm wondering, you know, and this is a question I think that any of you might be able to answer, um, you know, were there other kind of common threads, topics or themes uh, that emerged from the interviews um, like anything that kind of like, you know, was either Marshall Heights specific or could be plugged into kind of a larger city context or even, you know, national? Mm. Well, well, I would say this, you know, I think some of the, the common threads that I heard from everybody I interviewed was, again, how warm and welcoming the neighborhood, na neighborhood was how kids had an opportunity to, to be kids. 
and um, how active the community was in addressing their own issues and problems, yes. whether it was going to the big bad federal government at that time, <laughs> or you know even you know taking it amongst the, the community itself to address those issues. I had, you know at that time at the early part of um, of this of this community, we were under the commissioners. Mm -hmm. And because um, we had no we had no real um, government other than the commissioners, so everything went to the commissioners, and then went to the um, Congress. Um, everything you wanted had to go through Congress. <laughs> it was it was strange, but the community itself resolved problems. The community itself, and Debbie will tell you this: we weren't we were friendly with the police at that yeah. time. The police were our friends. I mean, they they um, they they appeared at our schools. They appeared in, in civic um, community meetings. They 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 appeared at um, we used to have festivals and and uh, all kinds of um, community involvement. And the police was always there as a as a true entity of the community. And so it was a community that relied on itself. They never thought of, unless they had to change some laws, <laughs> they never thought of going to downtown and asking to get something done. They even brought, they even made their own streets. Mm -hmm. They made their own streets. Um, 53rd Street was the first street that was really um, dug through. And Mr. Hicks, Mr. Campbell, and some others got their equipment that they used in the government and and plow through and got rid of got rid of the um, trees and everything and the neighbors got they started digging and they made their own streets. Oh wow. Um, yeah I mean that's an excellent example of like you know uh, kind of a community taking things like you know kind of above and beyond you would typically think of you know a community kind of taking on into their own hands. Um, yeah, I wonder if you all, um, you know, could possibly kind of like talk a little bit more about, you know, that kind of like, um, <clears throat> you know, element of Marshall Heights kind of functioning as a, you know, community that really kind of um, was self-reliant in that way. And also like, if there's a, you know, kind of a way to kind of talk about the Marshall Heights Community Development Organization and, you know, how it kind of played into that as well, either kind of like, as part of leading it or part of the legacy of that self-reliance. I'm wondering, can we um, take another clip? Um, sure. To maybe bridge that. Yep, so, definitely. Uh, so when I interview Ms. Tate, I also interview Mrs. Tate, Alice Tate, which is um, Ms. Loretta Tate's mother. And I'm wondering maybe we can play the, uh, the clip where we talk about farmland and shantytown and then maybe even the 1930s, 1940s, how you knew your neighbors. <laughs> So what? So what? Whatever happened to the the farmland? Because I'm, you, you know, you walk around the community now, and you, you, like I said, you wouldn't even know that we had. You wouldn't farmland. know. Uh, people, the, the new people in the community can't believe that we had a farm in Marshall Heights. Right. They call it years ago Shanty Town. Shanty Town, right? Mm -hmm. I, I was I was reading somewhere. Um, you know, a, a lot of a lot of black families, especially some returning vets, were able to get money um, to purchase land in this area. So they would buy the land, but it wouldn't be nothing on top of it. So they just built whatever they wanted to build. There was no regulations and code. That's it. That's it. That's it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they would have these um, shanty town, these um, tin roofs houses, and they was made from um, whatever they could get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And did you want to also play the uh, clip about um, kind of the interconnectedness of the neighborhood? Yes, please. Tell me a little bit about what was it like being a, a young child here in, in Marshall Heights in the in the 19 
1935, 1940. So what was that like? Huh? What was it like? It, it, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Well, yeah, everyone knew everyone. How so? Uh, they were neighboring, friends, helping one another. Really? Yeah. Was there a lot of other um, young young kids in the neighborhood when you was growing oh, up? Oh, yeah, 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 yes. And the parents, they would like all hang out with one another? Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did you have any best friends in the neighborhood when you were growing up? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the Hicks, the Camels, the, the Ward, um, the Turners. The Turners. The Jews. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, uh, I think that uh, that is. Um... Can I elaborate on the farmlands? Please, do. yeah, that's 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 what I was hoping you would actually. Yeah, that's what I was about to ask. <laughs> okay, his, you know, when they when they came here, they were from different areas. They were from the south. They were from um, some from the north, Chicago, some from the deep south, and so they all had skills. They were um, farmers. They were construction people. Um, some of them were bricklayers. Some of them were. Um, they could, they could build their own homes and things of that nature. So each person had their own skills and they contributed to the building of each other's homes. My grandfather, when he came here, he had bought his land as, and he had bought his land by working on the railroad. And each night he would come home and he would collect bottles, soda bottles, and he would clean them and then he would cash them in. And he would take the money and he would put it away. And that money grew so enormously that he bought, he bought the land, okay? And once he bought the land, he had to find someone to help him build the house. Well, his brother-in-laws and his, and his neighbors, people around about he got to know, they helped him build the house. And he built a four room structure house. <laughs> That's how they helped one another. The farming, my grandfather was a farmer. He came from Virginia. He, he helped them with their pigs and their cows and whatever else. He would slaughter for them and, and show them how to preserve the meat. And they always had these um, sheds where they put the meat in the sheds and they would, and they would put salt around them and they would um, preserve the meat. Well, he showed them how to do that, but they would come to him to kill, to, um, once it was killed, then he would process it for them. Uh, my grandmother was a graduate of um, Martha Washington, which was at that time called O Street um, Vocational High School for girls. And she was a seamstress. She graduated there and she made coats, she made um, dresses, she even made, um, a suit from um, a soldier's um, outfit, um, uniform for a little boy. I mean, she, and she taught kids, she taught young ladies how to sew. Some ladies taught people how to cook. So it was a united effort. The farming was a united effort. If you didn't know about farming, but you needed to, you needed food, they taught you how to do it. And they also shared their food. They shared everything that they had with one another. Great, yeah. Um, thanks for elaborating on that. So we're going to ask a little bit more uh, for a little bit more detail on this idea that, you know, the neighborhood kind of had like, you know, working farmland and everything, which you know, um, you know, perhaps it, uh, perhaps it wasn't, but it seems like it was, you know, kind of a unique thing, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for a neighborhood to have have something like that. Um, you know, those kind of elements of like, you know, people kind of using their talents to help each other out and to kind of bring the community together, you know, I'm wondering if like there are uh, kind of elements of that sort of like culture in Marshall Heights that you all see kind of like, you know, continuing today. Is there like a legacy tradition in Marshall Heights where, 
you know, you're not necessarily helping your neighbor slaughter an animal or anything like that, but, you know, people kind of like coming together and doing things, you know, collectively to help make the community better. Ms. Tommy, why don't you talk about the, um, the fair that you guys do um, in Chris's um, honor? Well, the, the kids, the, the young people themselves sort of done that. Um, my son died in 2001. And uh, so every year they, you know, cause he, he, was, he was one of the good guys, so to speak. And so every year the, the other guys who were all of his buddies, you know, cause he was 19 then, they, they celebrate. And about two years ago, they had t-shirts made <laughs> with the DC logo on the front. And, you know, we love you, Chris, on the back. And we got this, had the street blocked off. It was like this huge block party in honor of him, you know, and I was outdone, you know, it was, it was, it was very heartwarming for me, you know, and I said, you know, you guys have never forgotten. You know, they, they continue to do that. And, you know, so when I say that we try to still be a force for some positivity in the neighborhood is that, you know, I was talking to one of the young guys today and I'm like, you know, um, I, I see some, some behavior going on that I'm not exactly pleased with, you know, and I'm not going to call the police on you because we don't need that to go sideways, okay? But you all need to put it in check. And he said, oh, Miss Debbie, well, you hadn't said anything. So I guess we thought it was all right. No, I was just trying to let you come into your own and you didn't. So now it's time for us to step in and to tell you where we see you going wrong. And he said, no more problems. We will take care of it. And so, you know, I don't really think there are any bad children out here or bad young people. You know, they just get caught up in bad situations. And a lot of times what happens is we don't talk to them. And so we continue to talk to them. You know, they, they see my husband and they go, hey, Mr. Charles, you know, they, they listen to his old music, okay? <laughs> this is crazy. He was outside one day playing some old music and they were like, oh, I know who that is. Now, these guys are like in their late 20s or early 30s. And they were trying to tell him who these artists were and, <laughs> and that they knew this. So, and so they struck a vibe. And so, so we continue to try to keep that camaraderie between the old and the young, the seasoned and the unseasoned. We try to keep that going. And, and they, they help us do it. There's cool. something else, too. There, I, I didn't know it at first, but... What happened after I retired, my mother for years had been giving food to the poor um, and the um, homeless. Her Sunday dinner is shared by many. <laughs> I <And> know so, <laughs> It is shared by many. But you know what I, what I found though, that we weren't alone. There are, yeah. there are homes in this neighborhood where people know to go to get food. Um, I was going to church one Sunday morning and a young lady came up the street and she said, Miss, Miss, the man down the street told me I could get some food from you. She said, I'm having a, a diabetic attack and I really need some food. She, I said, well, sit right here, sweetie. And um, I ran in the house because I had already cooked Sunday dinner and I had, I have, um, I have plates and um, um, I have a big plate <laughs> that um, you can carry and um, portable plates. And I filled it with food. She ate, she went up the street and she was eating that food. My neighbors, I mean, there are numerous of us, numerous ones of us who feed the poor during the week. And we don't talk about it, but all of us know who's, whose house to go to if someone needs some food. Yes. <laughs> and, and I'll be remiss if I didn't say, you know, we're following after the, the legacy that Reverend Alvin P Pastry left us, that Ms. Tate left us at the Civic Association. And we do things too. We have Marshall Heights Day. Uh, mm -hmm. We just decorated, um, uh, Ms. Thomas was there. We just decorated the area for Christmas or for mm -hmm. holidays. We've been doing that consistently for the past two years now. Um, we have movie nights planned um, at Fletcher Johnson and we're gonna do some more community uh, market pop-up. So we, we tend to do a lot of things in the Marshall Heights community that um, come from a legacy of just people caring about their neighbors. And I think it's so important right now because, because the neighborhood's changing and you may not necessarily know all your neighbors. Your neighbors embraced you when you moved into the neighborhood, Keith, but they're like, I'm watching new neighbors move in and 
if we don't have a neighborhood block party, how do, how do we get these people engaged? And um, so I'm going to, you know, the flyer that you put out about the movies, I think I'm going to spread that around so that someone other than this small group of us knows yeah. what's really happening in the community. Great, yeah, and that, um, you know, kind of leads me to another question about like looking at this oral history project, like almost kind of like a, you know, process question, but, um, you know, like Keith, one of your original goals for the project was, you know, really kind of as a relative newcomer, newcomer to the neighborhood to kind of connect and, you know, get to know the neighborhood's history. Um, you know, now that the oral history project, at least this phase of it has been completed, you know, are there any plans or can you think of any ways that, you know, you might be able to kind of share back the stories and the memories that were collected um, to the community to kind of help other people maybe have that, maybe help other newcomers to the neighborhood, I should say, have that same sort of experience or, you know, make that same sort of connection with um, the neighborhood's, neighborhood's history. Yeah, um, you know, one of the ways that I, I love this is happening right now, um, and I, I do see some people that we invited that are on the attendees list, so they're checking out those histories or some new people in the community. Um, uh, through the Marsh Heights Civic Association, uh, we did have a presentation of the project to tell people what was happening with the project. Our goal, our hope is that we can get funded for a second year um, do another round of interviews. We want to get deeper into the community. Ms. Thomas and Mrs. Thomas and Ms. State has both said they got some people very interested in doing interviews. I got a few other neighbors that were mad that we didn't get to them this time around. <laughs> um, but we want to get all of that stuff and we want to put it in our own yards. We want to put it at the Capitol View Library, um, have a little display that just talks about Marshall Heights. Hell, it'll be even nice to get that library named Marshall Heights instead of Capital View. Oh, yeah, it's Marshall Heights. Finally, finally. It's not a Capital View. <laughs> <laughs> or, or after the um the one of the the uh, young ladies that was very instrumental in us getting mm -hmm. the the library, which was Judge Francis Bellinger. Bellinger. Um. So, but you know, we plan to have that stuff there too as well, and uh, have have a way for people to access it outside of just these type of presentations. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. And, you know, there are definitely a lot of ways, I think, you know, to um, kind of continue to put the stories, put the oral histories out there to the community. You know, I think that, um, you know, the block parties and the community days and everything like that, like, you know, anytime it's possible to, you know, put some of these excellent stories, these great clips that really kind of, you know, let people know kind of the tradition and the character of the community, you know, out there to the general public. I think, you know, every opportunity to do that, um, you know, is, is great. Um, we have time to play one more clip, the clip with Doc talking about just the character of the kids within the martial arts community. I think that uh, Mrs. Thomas and Ms. Tate will, will appreciate, you know, hearing, hearing from Doc. Yeah, I think that they, you know, actually kind of set it up very well with like their, the last answers that they gave, uh, you know, to that previous question. So I think that's a great idea. I didn't see a difference. All of the students that came from the Marshall Heights area mm -hmm. were basically fun kids, good kids. You know, it bring me to mind the guy that came out of uh, Eastgate. I got several guys that came out of Eastgate. Great. One in particular, uh, you may have heard of uh, what is Lindsay Streeter. You ever heard of Lindsay? I've heard of Lindsay. Let me tell you about Lindsay. Lindsay was a joker. Okay. okay, he had three or four brothers. I knew all of them. Had them all. I'm, I'm just part of their family. Lindsay went to the military. Stayed twenty some years. Oh, he made a career. Came out the highest rank a enlisted man could get. Master Sergeant something. He got a big rank, you know. Then there's Rodney Wilson. I know you heard of Rodney Wilson. You ever heard of Rodney? Heard of Rodney Wilson out of Fletcher. He was all-American linebacker. Yes. When H.D. Woodson. Wow. 
He went. He had all kinds of scholarships. He went to the University of West Virginia. Okay. okay. Started his first year and tore his knee. Mm-hmm. He didn't play anymore. And you got many, many students, and they stay in touch with me all the time. You know, mm-hmm. the big, big, uh, what's up, big uh, Fred. I'm sitting at Fletcher Mount Johnson one time looking at TV. The NCAA was on. And Kansas State were playing somewhere. All of a sudden, they said, Fred McCoy. I look. Fred McCoy, one of my students, too. I said, God damn. And, and it's just amazing to see how those kids, some folks have written off. Mm-hmm. You, see that. you don't write no kid off. You don't know how great they're going to be. They There any uh any any anything else to kind of say about uh about that clip? Any kind of additional context uh or um you know kind of talking about you know the youth in the community? Anything else from that particular interview that you would want to share, Keith? Uh, only just that, you know, Doc always spoke very highly of our community in Marshall Heights. Spoke very highly of you, Miss Tate, too. And I know we talked about it too, Mrs. Thomas. We talked about, you know, just Fletcher Johnson and what the future could hold for that particular site and how it can continue to give back to our community here in Marshall Heights. Um, Doc was something. The first year he was there, he was coming from H.D. Woodson as a, a third vice president, I mean, third um, assistant principal. And they made him principal of Fletcher Johnson. Um, parents came to me <laughs> and told me, this is a tough man. He doesn't understand us. And so I went to speak to Dr. Uh, Eldridge and um, he, he welcomed me in. We talked about positive things, not negative, how I could help, how he would receive help and how best to go about helping the children in Marshall Heights. Um, because of our, our relationship and partnership, we got several um, partnerships with federal government agencies. State Department was one of them, Justice. We partner with these um, government agencies and their employees came out, actually came out during the week to tutor the children. So um, I had, he was a great, great leader. And um, he had a difficult and diff- a very difficult um, situation there and position. But he made, I like said, he made the best out of everything he could do. He, he, he didn't just fight for education, but he fought for life, survival for those kids. Mm-hmm. And then I just want to make a correction too. Um, I think I might have said that um, Dr. Rutherford was the first principal. Rutherford. He was the second principal for Fletcher yes, Johnson. Yes, he um, was Rutherford. And we definitely got some Fletcher Johnson alum on the uh, call. So big shout out to our Fletcher Johnson alum on the call. <laughs> Future Fletcher all the way. Yeah. <laughs> all right, great. Um, yeah, so we just have a you know a couple more questions before we turn things over. Um, you know, to see if our, you know, attendees have anything that they want to ask. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm wondering, Ms. Thomas and Ms. Tate, now that you've kind of, you know, been through this oral history project and you've kind of experienced it from the perspective of narrators, interviewees, um, you know, as the second phase kind of starts, you know, I'm wondering if the experience has kind of made you interested in, you know, um, taking on some other roles in the oral history project. Would you want to, you know, be an interviewer or you know, uh, kind of be on the other side of the microphone going forward? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't mind. <laughs> I would help. Um, I enjoyed my time here. Um, I enjoyed being a part of this process and I look forward to the second half. I really do. Okay. I'm, I've always been good with outreach. <laughs> and so we, we can start from that aspect. Okay. <laughs> 
That's great. Yeah. Um, I know that, uh, yeah, sometimes, you know, you might be drawn to one side of the microphone and you may not exactly be drawn to the other. I'm not really sure how I would do as an interviewee uh, myself. Um, but, um, you know, for Keith, um, you know, again, kind of talking about the process, like now that you've gone through the initial phase of this, um, you know, and you've interviewed, you've collected some excellent interviews, you know, with some really great narrators, uh, which are now available, I should also mention, um, in the DC Public Library's uh, Dig DC online collection. Um, you know, are there any kind of tips that you would offer to people who might want to be starting their own oral history projects with their communities? Were there any challenges that you faced that, you know, you kind of came up with some unique or, you know, helpful ways to overcome? COVID. COVID, 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 COVID. <laughs> <laughs> COVID made it very difficult to get a lot of these interviews done, you know? Um, especially some of the uh, people that we interview that, you know, were older or maybe had a compromised immune system, you know, it, it just, it was just very difficult, but we, we always found a way, whether that was um, doing Zoom, if I had to drop off materials to their homes and kind of show them how to use it from a distance, we made it work, but it, it was just really very difficult because of COVID. I think had not COVID been around, it, it would have been a little easier. And that's another reason why we intentionally did not apply this particular year, because we just want people to be safe. Uh, we want to make sure people feel comfortable to be around other people and to, to hopefully be in a, in a big giant room with people. It would be great to, to do some interviews during Marshall Heights Day when we have a lot of people returning to the community to celebrate our community. Um, but in terms of tips, have really great um, um, equipment. Everything that um, that you guys suggest that we get, you should get. The, the Zoom recorder, I always notice the difference between when it was the Zoom recorder or, the, or using the actual Zoom software. So that, that recorder made a big difference in how you can hear people. Mm -hmm. um, also, you probably should go ahead and get the transcripts done as soon as you're done with your interview. That way you can review them and then everything is fresh within your mind. Mm -hmm. um, you should build in time so your narrators can also review some of their um, materials and have enough time to kind of give you feedback on things or if they want to do some things over, I think that was great. I, I was fortunate with Ms. Tate and Mrs. Thomas that we were able to do two interviews where we were able to have uh, 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 Ms. Tate's mother, Alice on one and uh, Mrs. Thomas' husband, Charles, on one. And that kind of served as a backstop so we could have a, a lot of materials. But, you know, maybe doing more than one session too with each of your, your narrators, I think, is another tip that I would say. And just last but not least, I think it's so important that you just don't ask people to be a part of the project without really trying to make sure that they, they're they comfortable with it and they want to do it. Um, I think the reason why the interviews are, are so enjoyable is because everybody that interview wanted to do it. They felt connected to the to the topic and they oh, they just really killed it. You guys really just did a good job and it, we, this project wouldn't be anything without you guys. So thank you for that. Great. Yep. Definitely some excellent advice. And I know that, um, yeah, doing your project like in 2020, you know, is a uh, just really unfortunate timing, but, you know, it seems like, uh, you know, you were able to kind of put together some ways of, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, the project was able to move forward. Um, yeah, um, I definitely agree that, you know, a virtual interview isn't ideal. Um, definitely always nice to be able to talk with somebody face to face, um, you know, setting up a, you know, much, much, much higher quality recorder. Um, but yeah, um, you know, I think that uh, like being able to kind of be familiar with those virtual options is really good to, you know, make sure the project was able to uh, continue because you can't always wait to collect these oral histories. Um, I think, you know, with that, um, we should um, probably like move to the uh, question and answer portion of this just to see if there are any kind of questions or comments any of our attendees might have. Um, again, 
Sure. While you're looking for questions, I was wondering, because I, I thought one of the interesting things about Mrs. Thomas and Mrs. Tate's story was that they share a few memories about some places. And That's I just, right, yeah. I think the real-time reaction between both of them talking about some of these things, I think, will be very beneficial for people as, you, as you're checking for questions from the audience. But in particular, I think, you know, we talked about J.C. Nall, um, yeah. cemeteries. yes the ice cream soda fountains. I don't know where you guys may want <laughs> to talk about, but you know, I just, I just, I love that when I talked to one person, it was confirmed in the other, you know, interview. And it was just, that was amazing. Just to see the cowbell, you know, from the, the cow that used to walk around Marshall Heights. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Bells. But the cowbell. soda fountain. Mm -hmm. Cowbells, chickens, you know, a lot of those things, but the, the soda fountain. Yes. I just figured everybody must have that in their neighborhood. I figured if we had something, everybody had things like that. And then as you grow older, you realize, boy, was that unique? You know, you know, remember Miss Pauline? She, yes. She, Doc. Yes. <laughs> and Doc. <laughs> and there's a counter, you know, you go over there and you see. Oh my soda. God. It's like you soda fountain. fountain. <laughs> yes. It was great. <laughs> it's funny um we had a full service um mall shopping mall it had yes. a grocery store it had a um, drug store with a soda fountain it had a laundromat and a liquor store and a liquor store was not what it is today it was right. family friendly family friendly it had cookies for us and fresh potato chips. Our parents worked in the liquor store. Yes. <laughs> yes, as a second job. Um, the grocery store, uh, Halloween, they would throw candy at, out of it, out of us, and we would just get all this candy and everything. The yeah. soda fountain, as we just said, oh my God, the soda fountain was so great. We had um, Miss Pauline was the at the, the fountain, but Doc would get at the fountain too and yeah. make us milkshakes. And we would read the the comic books, just like you see on TV. We would read the comic books. We would save our money, and sometimes we just read the comic books and put them back on the rack. Um, okay. <laughs> um, hot dogs, um, chili dogs, and all those kind of things. We ate there. Those is that's the place where we we uh, met our boyfriends. <laughs> And uh, all kinds of activities, uh, family-friendly activities, help happen around that grocery that 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 shopping center, and we knew everybody that worked there, and it was it was um, owned by the Jewish community, right? And and the and they even had credit in the grocery store, so right. people um, loved going to that store, that 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 small mall or whatever. It's still there, but it's not that kind of place anymore. Dang. But I mean, it was the grocery ahead. store was named Carver's because it was named after George Washington Carver. And in That's the back it. of the store, this big, huge picture of George Washington. George Carver. Washington Carver. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a great place to to grow up, and that particular shopping center was built when the houses was built. Now the right. houses that Debbie and I live in. And Debbie might have forgotten this. There used to be a sign there and it said Capsule View Terrace. And that was the okay. name of this development where we live, Capsule View Terrace. Okay. I, I know my father was saying what, part of it was Central Avenue Gardens. And, mm -hmm. you know, they had names. You could leave this, you know. I thought I was this great middle class person growing up. And then you get older and people tell you, oh, you live in Marshall Heights, you live in Shantytown. I'm like, but that wasn't the life for me. That's mm -hmm. not what I experienced. That wasn't, it wasn't I experienced a neighborhood, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I think that's, uh, you know, definitely one of the great things that oral history projects like this can do, you know, when people kind of have outside perceptions of things, you know, if they kind of listen to, you know, the perspectives of people who actually live somewhere, experience something, you know, they can get a better understanding of what it was really like. Um, I think that, um, you know, oh, we, I think we might have um, two questions. We have, uh, you know, a question here from um, Stacy Ferguson asking, what were some of the different ways um, you did your interviews with people in your neighborhood? 
Okay. Um, so either it was in person, like um, Miss Thomas came to the Mrs. Thomas came to the house. We sat and and, and did it. <laughs> with the mask, we were we were socially uh, COVID safe, socially uh, conscious of that. Um, for for the Tates, we did it via Zoom. Uh, mm -hmm. For uh, Dr. Rutherford, I he he was going to come to the community, but he couldn't make it, so I, I actually drove all the way out there to deep in Maryland <laughs> to go do that interview at, at his home with him and his wife, um, Mr. Hamilton. We did his interview in the Marshall Heights Community Development Organization building. So it was a combination of in person and Zoom. And I, a one unique thing too with the Zoom interviews, not only did we use the Zoom audio to try to capture voice, I purchased a recorder for the phone so we can also have a second backup, which I think really helped because the audio from the second backup is way better than the Zoom audio. Yeah, that's definitely good advice. You know, always nice to have a backup just in case some sort of, you know, catastrophe happens with Zoom. It's hard to rely on like cloud-based platforms and things like that, um, you know, as like kind of your only way. Um, I guess, you know, while we kind of wait for a minute and see if any other questions come in um, from the participants, you know, one thing that I wanted to ask uh, both Ms. Tate and Ms. Thomas, uh, you know, now that you have shared your story and, you know, you might have the opportunity to kind of do another interview and share more stories, but now that you've shared a story, um, it's been, you know, submitted to um, the DC Public Library Archives. What are your hopes for that story? What do you hope comes out of your participation in this oral history project? You know, I went to the Danewood Library one time, and uh, they had this, this full display talking about the history of Deanwood. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that we are more than worthy of something of that caliber, you know, with our, we could, you could do the same sort of thing um, with, with landmarks and with the interviews and really showcase Marshall Heights. You know, as we said earlier, it's one of the oldest black communities in the country, you know, mm -hmm. and it deserves a, a showcasing, so to speak, you know, so, and I hope something that I've said or, you know, that I will do in the future will help facilitate that. Mm -hmm. This um, community is, is better known around the world sometime than it is in the city. Um, the, the, um, pre the Queen of England visited <laughs> here and um, the trip and the visit we were the host, not the city. People didn't know that. Marshall Height Community Development Organization and the British Embassy was the host for the, the visit of the Queen of England and the White House. Um, it was an amazing community and it still is. And I think to live here, to live here, we need to know the history of it, to appreciate it and to be able to be proud of it. The other thing I'd like to add is that the Marshall Height Community Development Organization, it came right out of the Civic Association. It was a committee when I was president. It was a committee. And Mr. Anthony Hawkins was chair of that committee. I had gotten the information about a grant, a block grant. I researched it. I went door to door with some others and we did the evaluations. We did the, the surveys, we did everything. And we competed with some of the biggest names in this city, um, Macy's and other stores, and we won. We won that block grant. And that's how the Marshall Height Community Development Organization was organized and was funded from the Civic Association. But it, we got our 501c3, and so we, we separated from the Civic Association. But it, it was the problem because I was president of the Civic Association <laughs> and I was founder of the other. So the Civic Association took, took a, a, a downfall because of that. But it did, came, it came directly from the citizens of this community. Great. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I can't thank you all enough, you know, for joining us and sharing kind of, uh, you know, sharing these additional stories. You know, not only did were we you know, able to kind of hear your original interviews through some of these clips, but, you know, for continuing to share with us, you know, some of these other 
you know, great aspects of Marshall Heights and its history, you know, and thank you, Keith, for, you know, putting this all together for us. Um, I, I guess I would put out there, you know, one more time, does anybody who is, you know, still with us, are there any more questions that you might have for our panel that you would like to put into the Q&A? And if not, um, you know, I would say, you know, can we, uh, you know, maybe just go around um, one time and like have um, some kind of final thoughts. If anybody wants to, to add anything. Well, I would like to say to Loretta <laughs> that after hearing your stories, um, a lot of things have come to mind now that were probably dormant, you know, mm -hmm. uh, places, people, things that have happened in Marshall Heights. And, and so I'm so glad that I had the opportunity to be on this panel with you. <laughs> and um, I look forward to, to, to taking this to the next step. I do too, I do too. And I, I, I must apologize to the Central Avenue. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, they, they've had the reunion for years and I've known about it for years uh -huh. and I just haven't come. I'm sorry, I must apologize okay. to that. And I, I, I tell you this though, this neighborhood was known for its block parties because each block had a block captain and the block captain was, was uh, formed by the Civic Association. And that's <laughs> how they got one another. They got all of the neighborhood interested in the Civic Association because they had block captains. And then we had, each block had a, um, had their, in the summertime, had their block parties. We had the biggest <laughs> block parties in the city. Yeah. We had DJs. We had um, we had all of the singers because the singers lived here. The singers and the DJs born and lived in Marshall Heights. So we had the DJs, the singers and everything else here. And we were able to get them for nothing. We had the food because people bought the food. And so each each block had their own and we went to each block's um, block party. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about y'all block, but I can tell you we still do it on B Street. <laughs> okay. We do it. We do it every um, around Cinco de Mayo, whatever the closest weekend at Cinco de Mayo is. We have okay. it. Oh, I've missed it. I missed it, yeah. I missed it too. Next year we'll do it. You know, next year we'll, we'll also be doing Marshall Heights Day um, mm -hmm. for uh, Christmas this year. Um, well, for the holidays this year, we're gonna do um, the decoration again. Mrs. Yes. Thomas has, has volunteered to, to to be on the committee so we can figure this out. <laughs> decorate maybe all of Benning Road or I don't know yet. We, we're trying to figure that out, right? <laughs> yes. But, uh, we, we continue to do this. I guess my, my final thoughts or my re, my reflections is just that um, it, Marshall Heights is, is just a, it's a beautiful community. Mm -hmm. And I think the perception about Southeast is always, oh, is wild, um, it's dangerous, you know, and I, I'm not gonna say it's, it's, it's Mr. Rogers neighborhood, you know, there's there's definitely <laughs> things that can happen in any neighborhood, but for the most part, it's it's a really loving community. Um, it's just filled with so much his, history and historic knowledge that we need to preserve. We have a street named because the Queen walked down yes. a street. Queen <laughs> Street. <Street's laughs> what what other place in the U.S. I don't I don't I don't think you can say it. Any other place in the U.S. has that. Um, when we didn't have pipes. Um, the Civic Association worked to to make sure they got uh, Lady Roosevelt out here, so we can get those things done. You know, it, it's just a it's a beautiful community that is it shows the power of the people truly. Amen. Um, yes. So it's, it's, I, I'm so happy to be a Marshall Heights resident. I'm so happy that Marshall Heights accepts me as well. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all so much. Um, you know, this has been great and. You know, it's been a privilege for me to be able to, you know, ask you guys a few questions and, you know, have this conversation with you, um, you know, and to kind of work with you beforehand to, um, you know, think about, you know, how to make the program happen and everything as well. So, um, uh, you know, I, I look forward to seeing how the project continues to develop as well and to continue to see how, you know, these oral histories that you collected continue to be made more um, available to the public. Um, and I would just also say, you know, um, for anybody else, you know, who might be participating now or, 
you know, might want to watch the recording later, please do uh, visit the Humanities DC website, get more information about the DC Oral History Collaborative and the support that we offer. The DC OHC is a partnership between Humanities DC and the DC Public Library. We offer funding uh, for oral history projects. We offer training to help people learn more about how to do oral histories. And all the oral histories that are funded through the DC OHC are added to a growing archive in the Dig DC online catalog at the DC Public Library. So please do go over there now. We have, I think, you know, we have over 100 interviews that have been collected since 2017. So a lot of great history of all from all across the city that's being collected as part of that um, archive. Um, thanks again to everybody and thank you to the attendees for joining us. Thank you to our ASL interpreters. Um, and also thank you again to Tracy who, you know, all along here has been working behind the scenes to make sure that this program goes smoothly. Um, so um, everybody have a good night. And thank um, you. good night. Thank you very much. All right, good night. Good night, all right, good night everyone.